why don't we start off with just this idea of the economics on why someone would want to buy a book of business. So when you think about buying a book of business, why is that a good idea? I've always been a fan of starting with and growing through acquisitions. Now, with something like farmers, you're going to have to do both. You're going to have to have organic growth to earn the right, the opportunity to acquire. But I've always used it because in our business, scale matters. We need revenue and we need cash flow to reinvest and to grow. Now, Farmers has a program like a retail. Other carriers do have something similar. If you're starting from scratch, um, it is typically much less expensive to grow through an acquisition than to write the business. When we start looking at the costs associated with the overhead of team members, uh, especially as you start getting larger in the business, payroll costs, marketing costs, everything you write, first thing you have to do is factor your attrition, what you're losing. You have to write to offset cancellations and losses. Then you have to write to net grow positive premium. When we start looking at the cost associated as opposed to being able to go out in today's market at today's multiples and buy that revenue by buying a book of business or that premium, it's usually much more cost effective to acquire it. And then you have this speed to scale game. How long is it going to take you to write 5 million in premium? That may need to be seven or eight after cancellations and losses over three, four or five years to get to that $5 million mark. Or could we do it in the next 90 days? Grab that cash flow, reinvest into fast organic growth from there. Okay. So two ways to grow an agency. One is write the business yourself or take an established book and add that to your existing book. Okay. Um, what do the economics look like? And we'll, we'll take a small example, then a bigger example, million dollar bulk of business. So I have a million dollars in premium. And let's say I'm selling the book to you for a one X multiple. Uh, how much do you buy the book for from a cash standpoint? And then how much revenue are you making and how much your expenses are if you're financing it on a monthly basis and what does overall cash flow look like so on a one million dollar book for me at this point it, I, that would be what i would call a tuck in acquisition so if something is typically less than two million i'm not buying it if i have to maintain the existing location and the overhead costs associated because i don't feel like a million a million five has enough revenue to come off to can to make it worth my time to set up a whole nother location a whole nother team so if it's a million dollar book and it's going for one time that's a reasonable multiple for that size that's going to be a tuck in acquisition i am likely going to buy that we're going to eliminate the office we're going to roll it or tuck it into my existing business so on something like that i may not not even keep a million dollar book may have an employee, right? That's probably what we typically say. There might be one employee and then the owner. I probably won't even take the employee. I will typically say I want zero overhead associated. And so the only cost associated with that purchase is going to be the debt service, paying the loan for the book of business. So I use a real simple app. I'm pretty sure it's free. It's called Loan Calculator. And so what I would do is I would plug in, I can type this in real fast and I would plug in a million dollars would be a hundred grand. We said, is that correct? Yep. So 10%. 10%. We're going to look at a 10 year term rates around 7%. And so the monthly note on that's going to be 1161. That's the monthly note. So we would take that 1161. And we would multiply that by 12. And so the total debt is about 14 grand a year. So if it's producing 100,000 revenue, I'm not going to take an office location. I likely won't take an employee out of there. It's going to be about 14 grand. So we're going to make $86,000 of net profit after debt service by tucking it into my book of business. And the way I think about an acquisition that size, who is that paying for? If I acquire a million dollars, it pays me a hundred, costs about 14 grand a year to pay for the debt. I've got about 85, 86. 
Is that one service person I can Im improve in my current operation? Can I go hire another salesperson to help us grow faster now that I've brought that extra cash flow in? So that's why it's going to be a tuck in acquisition at that size. If it is something that they've got a three year lease left and I've got to take on a location, those are usually things I would back away from at this size. Because if their office rents 30 grand and the debt service is 14, we're already at close to $45,000 of the hundred available. Now you put an employee there. I'm like, you, you're making 15, 20 grand a year and you're taking on debt. And that wouldn't make sense for me at that size. So it's going to have to make sense to kind of roll it into my existing operation. Okay. I want to pull up a calculator right here. Just so probably the same calculator that you found. And I just want to make sure that we're doing the math the same way if i'm selling you a book of business for 100, yeah, 100, 100 grand loan term we're doing 10 years Here, interest, interest about seven yeah 1161 and so then, that's at 1161 each month so then my thought the way i think about it because we know it's 100 grand a year i multiply that 1161 by 12 it's close to fourteen thousand a year you're going to be paying okay and then uh as far as uh, monthly basis if your projected revenue from this book is what 100k mm -hmm. for the year divided by 12 so it's 83 minus the let's round up to 1200 yep essentially what you're doing is you're adding seven thousand dollars a month in cash flow that's right I, I look at things from a monthly standpoint it just makes more sense my end versus annualized. So I'm adding an extra $7,000 in cash flow. And so what could you do with an extra $7,000 of net positive cash flow each month? And so again, we think of we're trying to grow, we're trying to build, we're trying to scale. So we just increased our revenue by a hundred grand. We increased our premium by a million dollars and we freed up $7,000 of free cash flow. So can we go hire another salesperson and provide marketing for them with that money? How do we expand using those funds? Okay. Uh, let, let's compare that to a $5 million book of business. Okay. $5 million book in Texas. The market matters, but I was going to, I would say you're going to pay probably at least a 1.5 multiple on something that size, I would imagine. So if you just want to take simple math, 5 million, 500 grand um, times one and a half, maybe we start with that. Okay. So 500 grand times one and a half is 750. Okay. 10 year, 7%. Yep. Do you always like doing 10 year? My theory is always to structure a 10 year note because it gives you breathing room at the beginning. But what we do is we will request no prepayment penalty, meaning we can pay it down early. We can pay it down faster. So we stretch it for 10 years. So the payment's smaller, but if it's going really well, we can pay it down quicker. But if we make a mistake and things are tighter than we anticipated, at least we have breathing room and we didn't get ourselves set with too big of a note too soon. So the monthly payments would be around say $8,700 per month yep. on a book of business that is 5 million, assuming 10% commission, uh, you have 500K is what you're making for the year per month. That equates to about 41,000. You right. subtract the 8708. We're looking at, you just added $32,000, 33,000 in additional cash flow. And on something this size, you're going to have rent, right? You're going to have to keep a location, I would imagine. So you're going to have you're going to have things like rent overhead. You're going to have a couple more employees. But the benefit is, we just showed that after debt service, you're still north of thirty thousand dollars a month. If rent costs you three grand, you still have twenty seven. And now you can go keep a couple service team members. You can add on sales team members and grow. Um, but we always look at again, how long would it take to have organically grown that 5 million? What would the cost be associated or can we buy it and close it in the next 60 to 90 days, reinvest that 30, 31, 32,000 a month. And we can expand our sales team. We can start to grow faster by utilizing that free cash flow. What's the biggest book that you personally purchased? So Six, far? Million. Six million. Okay. Did that come with staff? That came with staff. Um, typically, what we will see um, is some of the team member that is existing will stay long term, um, and then some will turn over. It, 
we love books that are older and tenured with existing people, but sometimes um, there's a fine line between the experience and the tenure and the pace at which the team members are used to working. Um, I can tell a story about a book I did a while back and a uh, customer service team, very educated, very talented, long tenured. And they were like, man, we're so busy. We're doing this. We're doing that. Well, how many calls are you taking a day? We're getting like 12 to 15 calls a day, each person. I'm like, oh, because my people, my people take like 40 to 50 calls a day. Um, and so you start thinking, I'm like, well, you've been here for nine years. Um, you're okay with the level of income that you're at and you've been at for nine years. You're used to this pace of work. So even if I show you that we can increase your income, you, you've been happy with it for nine years. So the odds of me saying, can I triple your work volume, but I'll also give you more money and you being satisfied are probably pretty low. So sometimes people are thrilled when we come in and they see the growth potential and they're excited about change and opportunity. Um, and then sometimes it's just not a good fit culturally um, or, or the pace at which we work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point because uh, the expectations of the previous owner set will dictate how they're going to operate moving forward uh, when you acquire the book. Uh, I want to circle back to staffing here in a moment, but before we do, I want to ask about red flags. What are some immediate turnoffs when you look at a book of business? An agent calls you, says, Josiah, I have a book for you to analyze. I'm considering selling. What are some questions that you might ask? When they answer, you're like, oh, this is definitely not something I want to do. I would say that um, size matters as far as revenue and premium, but it's really the the interior of the book. It's the mix of business that can be the biggest thing. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? I actually have a report. I would like you. Know, we had done an example. Let me pull this up real quick and I will share it on our end. This is a sample book of business. It's close to a million in premium just under, but it's a, it's a good sample. And so when we look at this, Red flags for me are going to be things like extreme dominance in a particular line of business. So farmers counts each vehicle as a policy. So you're typically going to have more autos than you will fire or home policies. But we don't want to see that too far out of whack. So on this one, total autos in April is 970. Total fire is 548. If that was different, and let's say the auto was fourteen hundred and the home was two hundred, that would be a major red flag to me. This is not a cross sold book. This is an auto dominant book. We're one large rate increase or underwriting cycle away from hemorrhaging policies because my entire business is going to be affected by one change because it's all in one bucket. So I like to see a good mix of business and then getting a little more detailed even. We're a preferred company, we're a preferred carrier, we're preferred auto, we're preferred home. So we have the ability to write things like Bristol West, but that's not our specialty. And that's a little more volatile business typically. Usually that's more associated with some of the NSF, some of the more uh, service intensive work. So when I look at a book, I do like to look at their total auto and then their Bristol West and see what their makeup is. And if this book had 50-50, Farmers Auto in Bristol West, that would be a concern for me because why are we getting so many people that do not qualify for standard or preferred farmers business? If they're not, also we may not be able to cross sell the home. What are the issues? Are these high loss ratio individuals? Are they poor payment? Are they people that have lots of lapses and keep letting their insurance cancel? So the red flags are usually going to come to me from the mix of business. Um, is it bundled? Is it cross sold? Is it well rounded? And then even getting more detailed inside of those, what exactly type of customer are we seeing? And I will pay more, a higher multiple for a well cross sold, well rounded book of business. Um, for me, it has a higher value. And there's almost no price that's low enough for me to take on a book that's not built that way. Because once I acquire, I need to grow it because I need to show farmers that I, I can deserve the right to buy again in the future. So if I buy it and I can't outrun the mix of business and the cancellations, I'm only hurting myself. Even if I got it for a cheap price, they see those policies just disappearing and me going backwards every single month. The odds of me coming back and saying, I want to buy another book are very low because they're going to say, look at what you did with the last one. You lost all the policies. So I need to make sure I'm being careful and thoughtful when I am looking at an acquisition. If they're very fire heavy and low on auto, do you look at that 
from an invoice standpoint where you say, well, this is an opportunity for me to cross a lot of auto. I do like home um, and I'm, I'm not opposed to if it's a higher home, lower auto book. I think that's a lot. Most people who own homes, they have vehicles so we can cross sell. So I, that, that's not a concern for me. And conversely, what, what does throw people off sometimes when I say this, I try to write farmers business. We prefer writing farmers. Obviously in Texas, we have craft like as an option. I prefer writing farmers business. It pays us better. It counts for our achievement clubs and leaderboards and such, but I have no problem buying books that have a lot of craft like because craft like is typically going to be a lot of home. It's pretty stable. And the odds of all the carriers in Craft Lake taking the same rate increase at the same time are very low. So if Farmers takes a 10% rate increase on home, odds are Sageshire isn't right now. Wellington isn't. And if Homeowners of America takes eight, Sageshire may not be taking anything. So while well, we try to write mostly Farmers, if the acquisition comes with a fair amount of Craft Lake, I don't consider that an issue for me because it's stable, it's pretty diversified, and it's not bad to own. When you look at just generally your guidelines that you follow to determine your multiple. How do you know if you're going to do a one, two, three, like, or, or go beyond that for a multiple when purchasing a book? Typically, if it's under 2 million in premium, then I'm going to be in that one to 1 1.4 times. And where it falls on that spectrum is going to be the mix of business that we discussed. Once we cross 2 million, that starts inching up one and a half, 1 1.6, 1.7. But again, it depends on the mix of business and it depends on the size. As we showed whenever you broke that down, it's a drastic difference whenever you start getting from a one to a five or a five to a $10 million opportunity. You know, one has $7,000 of cash cash flow available after debt service, and one has $32,000 a month available after debt service. So it does demand a higher multiple based on the cash flow. But again, even if it's large, the mix of business still has to be right. We're trying to determine the cross-sell opportunity. We're trying to determine the bundle rate, the retention. Another thing I will say, and this may sound funny to people, I'm not necessarily looking for a very fast-growing book of business. I would prefer to buy someone who's been in business for 15 years, who writes a little bit and is real stable. Zero to two years, I think in the insurance parlance, they call it the green curve. It's higher volatility the first two years when you write a policy. If someone's putting up 500000 a month in new business, probably may not be something that I'm super interested because it's moving on very quickly. It's a lot of newer policies. Loss ratio could be higher. And there could be some more volatility. So when I'm looking for a target, I really like stable, moderate, tenured, and I'll pay a better multiple on something like that. Yeah. You want people who have been in a book for a long time. They're not price shoppers who are switching every year or two. And it also sounds like you really get into the weeds on figuring out what type of business exists in that agency. To determine that, what reports do you look at and what specific numbers do you review to underwrite a deal? So there's really basically five reports we go through. It's going to be the statement of operations, which I shared. There's the premium summary, a rolling 12-month mover. It's going to be a picture of your whole year. There are income statement. There's the year-to-date commission. And then ABR, which is the agency business results. Now, disclaimer, if someone themselves who is selling has bought a book in the last 12 months, um, some of those reports are going to be a little confusing. Things like the agency business results that has retention reports are going to be skewed because they bought a book and it rolled in and the reporting can be a little confusing. But we we do those five reports and half a second link them to you if you want to send them out to whoever. We do those five reports because if one may be off slightly, we can get a holistic picture of what the agency has and what they're dealing with. So we're looking at how much income is there in a year, how much revenue is in a year. How much premium in a year, that rolling 12, statement of operations for the mix of business, agency business results for really the same things, just a different way to view it with some retention. Um, and then the income statement, because that's also going to break down if it's someone who just maybe came off a retail contract or an older agent who has things like underwriting profitability bonuses. It's going to break down and itemize what those things are. Um, as a rule, we don't pay on non-replicable income. So what I mean by that, 
I cannot get a retail bonus if I buy someone's agency. So if someone's coming off their last year of retail and they did an extra $100,000 in commission through retail bonus, we back that out of the revenue. I'm not going to pay you one and a half times on your retail bonus. I can't ever get it because I'm buying a book of business. We would pay on normal, repeatable commissions. Um, same thing with some of the older agents. Well, I've got a $20,000 underwriting profit bonus. Hey, you're on an old contract. No one gets that. I can't get that. No one can get it. So I'll pay you on all the rest of your revenue, but I can't include that because it's nothing anyone else can ever get. Okay. So it sounds like you're calculating the commissions minus any bonuses. That's ultimately what you're looking at for uh, when you don't just look at the revenue of what the agency made in the last 12 months, because revenue includes the normal commissions, bonuses, any other um, kind of spiffs that the company might have done during the course of a year. I'll include revenue on things that we can also get as agents currently. So if they got like an annual growth bonus and it was $30,000, we don't back that out. We include it. You get an annual growth bonus. I can get an annual growth bonus. It's included. But if you're coming again off a retail contract and you've been getting this super enhanced commission, it wouldn't make sense for me to pay you on the numbers from a super enhanced commission that the day I take over disappears and can never be per never be done again. So that type of almost like a one-time thing that's non-repeatable um, would have to get back there. Okay. Um, as a seller of a book, what can I do to, and I'm not selling my book, which is a hypothetical, <laughs> what can I do to increase the value of my book outside of just having a good mix of home auto, life, specialty, what else can I do? So I do think the mix definitely matters as we discussed. I think having that tenure. So if you're putting yourself in a position where even when the decisions, you're not a seller now, right? You're not selling. But if you start thinking, okay, if I, what if I wanted to exit in 10 years or 20 years, what are the things I should be doing today to create a legacy of tenure? That is, if as a buyer now, I would want to buy this later on. And so we talk about things like, um, how we grow the book of business. What are the retention rates? Are we looking for one-time pops to make things uh, financially appealing now? Or are we building the book of business right? Um, there's people that we maybe choose not to insure, that they feel like they aren't a good fit. And that can be hard for salespeople. So we have a lot of in-house kind of eligibility and underwriting comments where, hey, they don't have a good track record. It may qualify if we do this and that, but is that really the clientele that we want in the book of business? Because down the road, those are the things that are going to affect our retention. Um, and then it is having a staff. Again, it may work during the transition or it may not. But when you have a really quality team, it does help, especially if this is someone who's a first time buyer. If this is someone who's coming into the business and you can present, here's my business and my two team members, they have 10 years experience. They want to stay on with you for a first time buyer. That can be hugely valuable because it gives them the opportunity to get in and learn the business and stay above water while those team members kind of keep things going for the beginning. Um, Someone who's super experienced like yourself, you may want to keep the existing team. You may not. You may feel like your own people can provide more value or you may want to train them differently. But a lot of purchases do go to first-time buyers um, who are getting into the business and having a good team in place as part of your value prop can be very impactful. Okay. I'll give you some hypothetical numbers. Give me just what, what feels right as far as a multiple, okay? okay. We're going to do a plus or minus game. Um, let's say it's a $3 million book in Texas, uh, and we have uh, an even home and auto rates, uh, not rate, but mix. So same amount of home as auto or fire as auto. And uh, a good amount of specialty, good amount of life. So you have the perfect mix. Uh, no staff is coming with it. So just the book, $3 million book of business. What would be a multiple just uh, for for a, a book that's been around, say, five years? 1.7. 1.7, 1. 7. okay. Uh, if I say, Josiah, I'm also giving you my CRM with all the notes, how we got the client, how they came to us, the conversation notes from the very beginning when we started working the lead, and then once it became a client, all the notes that we attached to it. And 
of course we wouldn't be perfect, but we would have no and most big things that took place. And I'm giving you access to that database. What does that do to your multiple? I typically move at one point when we get access because that usually a CRM comes with existing customers notation, which helps us expedite the process for things like cross-selling. But usually a CRM like that also includes tons of prospecting data. You're probably getting a lot of potential winbacks, quotes not closed, things like that. So I would add a whole point to the multiple um, to that because you have your existing clients, which helps the transition, but you also have old data that's going to become valuable because you and I both pay for marketing. We know the cost associated with that. Okay. Yeah, that's huge. An extra point is is massive. You're going from 1.7 to 2.7 ish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, from 1.7 to 1.8. Oh, okay. So there's, okay. A, there's a small bump, so it's helpful, right. but I wouldn't jump. Right. I wouldn't jump past two. But from one point to one point, so it's valuable, but it's not a game changer. What I've found also is, um, this is just as, as a side note. When we've taken over a book of business, I used to send out a notice. Farmers allows you to send a notice. There's an email, a letter that goes out. Um, we do not do that anymore. We feel like alerting people to the change can be a little disruptive. So what we do now is, even if we have details like that, we stay quiet. And when those customers call in, we see that it's one of the new ones we acquired. Um, they let them know that the agent has retired. They make them feel warm and fuzzy on the phone when they're kind of confused, help them solve their problem. And by the end of the call, they understand that we're just as good, if not better than their past experience. So we don't want to send them a cold email or letter and let them know that the guy they know is gone. And now they're going to someone strange. Let them come to us, assist them, do a fantastic job on that first interaction, make them give them the warm and fuzzies. And that's dramatically helped any attrition or turnover um, whenever we've acquired an agency and so things like having that serum that does help some knowing we've never talked to you before but i do see that you're here your grandson john he has the car and they're like oh okay this feels just like it did before yeah is there a specific script that you have your customer service team use to explain who you guys are they do when they you know, you know is john available you know john actually retired but great news and they talk about us our tenure the size of the team um and the amount of years that we've been in business and they go right to it what can i assist you with today and um, we tell we preach to the team all the time that first interaction is the most important interaction you're going to have in that book of business that's going to show them who we are and they may not give us a second chance okay um going back to the negotiating strategies as a seller if you're selling a book of business, uh, let's say Josiah, you, you're packaging your book right now, selling it, and you want to sell it for the highest amount, and I'm your buyer. What are some things that you would tell me about your book? You have a good mix. You've been around for a while. Um, what would be some other things that you would tell me to increase the perceived value of what asset you're selling me? Is there anything else besides what we've already covered? So for someone who, like me, so I mentioned earlier, I don't necessarily love targeting high growth agencies, but if I was selling mine, I'm going to do the exact pivot. I'm going to pitch on why that's a fantastic thing because we're all salespeople. So mm -hmm. for someone like me, I would be pitching the team, the processes we have in, in place. And so whether it's the process we have around marketing, the processes we have around new biz compliance, I would make myself available and say, hey, here's everything we have in the agency that makes it run the way they, it does. I'm going to share that with you. And am I might even stay on and say, hey, I'm going to do a 60 or 90 day consulting thing with you where you come in and acquire and I'm going to be available to help transition 60 to 90 days, get these processes in place for you, make sure everything maintains. Here's our track record. You know what we're capable of. Let mm -hmm. me help you keep it in place as I sell to you in a step out. See, that's where I was going with this question, because when I think of buying a book of business, just buying the rights to the renewals is different than buying a functioning agency. So when I hear selling a, say, a $3 million book of business for 1.7, 1.8, that's fine. But what if I'm also selling a team of five people, a team of 10 people who are trained on how to sell the agencies doing 200,000 in premium per month, that's an extra 2.4 million in premium that you're about to add in addition to the three that you're buying. I feel like that in a way has even more bearing to the multiple, the future growth, because you're you're essentially buying a, a system along with renewals, system to grow and renewals. 
How does that affect, say now you're the buyer? What what multiple would you be willing to purchase a, a agency that's writing 200,000 in premium? They have say uh, six, seven producers who are breaking even with their current comp plan where they're not costing the agency owner money. Mm -hmm. And even how do you calculate your multiple with a purchase like that? If we fail, I, something like that would require what I would call a deep dive, hands-on deep dive. The reason I say that is I'm a compliance freak. I like things done right, keeping everything tight. Compliance matters. It's super important. So we would want to do a deep dive and see how are they hitting these numbers. And if we feel like these are good processes, which I'm assuming in this hypothetical they are, they're good processes. Now we're talking about going from this is not a book of business that was cranking on new biz. He liquidated his staff. He wants to exit. And it's like, there's no one here and it's all brand new. That's scary for me. This is a system. It's a machine we're going to come into. Now we're talking about that two time multiple where I'm going to say, yes, I'm paying for the business. I'm paying for the renewals. I'm also paying for the existing talent to continue in their current capacity because I want them to keep on doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we would, yes, try to raise something like a, let's say, hypothetically, you were going to sell, I was going to buy your agency. You've got great team, great processes. Okay, Vlad, this is going to be the multiple now. And can I pay you for a consulting thing to stay on, help the transition, make sure nothing falls off until we have our arms around this? Yeah. In a way, it's cool that this seller has done 200000 in premium, but as a buyer of the agency, you might not want to adopt a lot of the systems that they've had. You might have a, a different method of acquiring business. So yes, it might have worked for that agency owner, but you're not taking everything with the purchase of the book. Right. We saw a book I advised on, a, I consulted on a deal and the gentleman was more in the San Antonio area. Um, predominantly Hispanic, and he did all direct mail. He did direct mail to San Antonio, direct mail to all the border towns. And so he was kind of making this pitch. He's like, I'm going to show him how I do it, give him my contacts. And I'm like, the guy buying your agency doesn't speak Spanish. I'm not sure all Hispanic direct mail target is going to be something that he's going to be able to get his arms around and really take advantage of. Like, you've done phenomenal with this niche and you've crushed it. Um, but I'm not sure it translates the value to this buyer the same as it was for you. So you're right. It has to be the right mix. It still has to be something that you, you want to adopt in your agency. Okay. So just to put a number on it, uh, you would buy something like first number that comes to mind closer to 3%. Is that right? Or higher than that. If you're buying a system to go with it, that closely aligns with your marketing system. Let's say you, uh, you do have Spanish staff, in your current book of business and you're buying a book of business that is also Spanish predominant. I would say that would go for somewhere probably between let's say it's the few million in premium and you have that and it all makes sense. Now you're looking at probably two, 2.2 times. And the reason I still stay around there is we work with a number of banks. I'm very open. I typically work do deals with wind trust. Um, but almost every bank gets freaked out once you cross the two time multiple. And what happens once you're past two times is now you're into, you're going to have to start putting more cash down likely in order to bridge that gap, or you're going to have to ask the seller to hold a note, or you're going to have to do a combination of both factors. Typically, um, a bank will loan the majority of those funds when you're in that one, one and a half, 1.7 times. Once you start hitting over two they're going to pretty much stop loaning there and you're going to have to come up with the difference of everything over that. So there is a negotiation phase two where it may become you and I both agree your book is worth a 2.3 multiple. The two times comes to the bank, the 0.3, maybe you're holding a little, I'm bringing some to the table. We're meeting and we're making this work. Now that we're again in a part two where we both agree there's a little bit more of value than is typical, then even a bank may say, this is what we would like. So if we're going to pay a little bit of a premium, we have to figure out how does that work for both of us to make sense. Okay. And generally speaking, if we're talking less than 2X multiple, Wintrust and other banks that you've worked with, how much of it can they finance? Can they finance 100% of the purchase? Typically for an outside buyer, because they have no existing equity, what we'll see is occasionally 100%, but typically about 90% is what they'll do. They'll want 10% in. Um, 
once you're an existing agency owner and you have some equity, then typically we can get 100% finance. That's what I've done on my deals um, because we have equity. And so we buy, the value increases as we organically grow. We're growing equity. We go to do another deal. They, they run the numbers on my agency. They say, hey, we've got this much equity, so we're good to go. We can loan the full amount again. So if you're mm -hmm. coming in from the outside, probably have to put 10% down unless you're very credit worthy and very um, financially stable. Um, once you're an existing agent, typically you can get the full amount as long as you've got some decent equity in your book of business currently. Okay. So that's something to think about too, is people will say, well, I don't want debt. Well, hey, that's completely your call, but think about this. You could do a 10 year loan. Think about the numbers earlier. Instead of putting down a hundred thousand dollars and burning through a hundred thousand dollars of cash, you can put down $1,161 a month for the first six months. Make sure it works. Deploy your cash to grow. And when you know it's working, Start taking huge chunks out of that loan. There's no prepayment penalty. We, we negotiate that. Start knocking it down. But conserve your cash. Use the bank money. Use your cash to grow. And once you know you're actually able to do this, you can pay it off quicker. But make sure you give yourself some breathing room. Okay. Uh, and I know this will vary from state to state. We're in Texas where we're in, a, in the middle of a storm. We had announcements of so many restrictions that just... <laughs> kept coming and coming and um, even more um, here recently. But here in the not so distant future, hopefully it'll loosen up and this will become a growing market again. When you look at Texas specifically, a non-growing market with what you know in the past five years ago, what were books selling for? So taking that same example of what we were talking about, how would have things been different, say three years ago? And if things loosen up and go back to normal. How do you envision that being again in three years? As I think it's the combination of is the market conversation and then there's the interest rate environment. Um, but I mean, when I bought my first agency, which was back at Allstate, um, for a $6 million book, I paid a 3.2 time multiple. And three to three and a half was pretty normal. We see that kind of more three to four times on the independent side now. Captives just don't go for that. They go in that one to two time. Um, part of that's the market. Part of that is just the state of the market. And then part of that is the um, interest rate environment. Obviously, rates are much higher now. I've told some people this. I kind of feel, you may have seen the jokes, you know, I should have been buying houses in 2008 instead of being in middle school. You know, and I kind of joke the people that went in heavy 08, 09 and really bought whenever everything was a mess, um, it worked out for them. And I've kind of looked at this as our 2008. I think that the future looks really good, but this is a scary time in a lot of states, Texas included. Um, but because there's fear and because there's difficulty, the prices are suppressed. When I buy a book at one and a half times, I am paying less than 50% of what I paid on my first deal. The free cash flow for that for me is insane whenever I use a comparison. So we've been trying to grow as much as we can. We've been trying to buy, believing that rates are going to change. I believe it was Warren Buffett um, is the quote, um, buy whenever there's blood in the streets. But what people usually do is they leave off the last half of that quote. The actual quote is buy whenever there's blood in the street even if it's your own. Right. And so I think that this is kind of, I joke like our 2008, um, people are panicking. Some people have left. Some people are nervous. Why would you buy? Why would you expand? We have to survive. Prices are less than half of what I used to see. This is the best time I've ever experienced in my career to acquire and grow. Growing isn't easy, but it's doable. And we can buy at a price I've never seen. And so we're utilizing that. And there could come a time when multiples are three or four times again. And I probably won't be buying at that time. It'll probably be really easy to write business, which is why they're high. And I'll probably be focusing on purely organic growth. But at this market cycle, it makes a lot of sense to me to go grab it at that income. I think you're exactly right. I'm with you on that. When times are tough, it's hard to imagine a brighter future. You just think that this is what the new reality will be. And the truth, though, is everything will change in the coming years. We don't know if it's going to be for the better or for the worse. <laughs> uh, but five years from now, we're going to be in a different uh, position. But that said, interest rates will also be a big factor here. 
if interest rates remain as what they are now, uh, the I, I, how, how do you think that's going to impact book sales in the future if the market loosens up as far as it's easier to write business, but interest rate stays the same? I think that if the two coincide, it would be a perfect world, which we virtually never get. Um, but if the market got easy and writing was super simple and rates went down to 3%, valuations would be crazy. Assuming they just stay about where they are for the next 5, 10 years and just nothing changes, and it's just the market shifting, I think valuations still get better. The only thing I can look at is could they get worse? Theoretically, they could, but I don't see in a business that has the renewals, the repeat purchase, the existing customer base um, going below a one-time multiple. So I think as long as we're buying intelligently, we're buying conservatively, or if we do pay more paying for quality assets, we've kind of established a floor. And so worst case scenario, we should be able to exit at about where we got in, but it'll be larger and more valuable because of the size. Um, and if either rates change or the market does loosen, then it should, in my opinion, go up from there. So assuming I buy for one and a half and I can only sell for one and a half in 10 years, but if I bought that one and a half and it was 2 million, now it's 20 million, there's my exit. And if the market gets better and if rates get me down, then that could just go up from there. So we have to establish a floor. Tell when you, we, we negotiate, tell people, know your walk away number. What is the number that you will absolutely pull the trigger at? And what is it that you will walk away at? And do not negotiate with yourself to move past that. So if your top end is 1.6 times, do not buy at 1.7 or 1.8. If it's two, you're there. As a seller, the same thing. Don't take below your number. Have a floor. And as long as you operate within what those safety parameters are, you should be okay. Do you have any negotiating strategies that you share with agents you work with as far as seller or buyer or things you want to avoid doing to not show your cards? <laughs> I know I, I honestly I do believe in transparency and here is why the bank is going to require the reports I labeled or I mentioned earlier and that's going to tell the whole picture so you, you I mean have... more from like a being de desperate and the reason I ask is there's an agent who I was talking to recently he was selling his book first deal first buyer fell through they became ineligible and it was last minute so now this agent is in desperation mode he wants to sell ASAP uh, he has something already lined up afterwards. He wants to get rid, get rid of the agency as quickly as possible. There's a potential buyer that he was meeting and uh, him and I were on a, on a call and he said, I'm going to meet him this weekend. And uh, what do you think I should should do? What do you think I should say? My, my first thoughts that crossed my mind is you sound very desperate right now. <laughs> and what you don't want to do is do not show how desperate you are because the moment you start showing how desperate you are to sell, if the buyer sees that, they're they're going to buy for less than what your bottom number is because they know you have to sell. It's kind of like buying a foreclosure or a, <laughs> a, a beat up home. It's like, if you have to get rid of it, you'll get rid of it for whatever price, way less than what you should. Mm -hmm. um, so equivalent to being put on a performance plan. You know, if you're someone who's a bottom achiever, maybe you've had a warning from the company or your DM and it's not looking good and they kind of want you out. These are not things you would want to necessarily disclose. As a seller, you want to tell people that you have options, that you feel like you want to either retire or pursue something different, that you have time. Never show that you don't have time. And as a buyer, you do want to look for people who have good businesses but you definitely have leverage when someone has to make a quick exit. Um, and the only really negotiating thing I would say is as a buyer, um, and this may be a little technical, but when, you, when you're when you dealing with a bank, if they'll loan 90% and they need 10% down, what that means is they need 10% equity, equity in the deal. Cash from a buyer satisfies that or a seller note, an owner finance of that 10%, seller notes are equity in the deal. And so a good negotiation for a buyer who wants to come in and maybe can't put the cash down or is trying to conserve so they can grow is if they need that 10% to lean on that seller note piece. Um, some people say, well, it's a larger deal. 10% down for me is $150,000. If I do, that's going to really make my first couple months tight. We can get the seller to hold 150 grand 
and that satisfies the equity requirement for the bank. And you and the seller can work that out. Is that a five-year note, a three-year note, a balloon, how you want to do that? But that's one of the keys that we've seen a lot of deals get stuck on that last 10% of how do I close, how to bring cash to close. And it can almost always be remedied if the seller says, fine, I'll take 90% of my money at close and you can pay me at the last 10% over three years and then deals go through. Yeah, can you give me some numbers to kind of illustrate and paint a picture of what that would look like? Because seller let's finance- use a, Let's use a purchase price that you're paying. Let's use the $5 million one. So you're paying 750,000 for it. So if you're paying 750,000, 10% of that is what? 75 grand. So you've got 750. The bank wants you to put down 75,000. So they're basically said, we'll loan you 675, but that's all. You got to come to close with $75,000. And the guy says, well, I've got a hundred grand in my checking account. And I wanted to use that for the first two months to really have staff. And, and if I dip into that, it's going to make it tight. So I can go to the seller and say, hey, I can pay you 675. Of the 750, you will get to the day we close. But that last 75 grand, I need you to hold as a seller's note. And here's what we can do. Interest rates are about 7%. So I'll pay you 7% on that. And I'll pay it out over three years. And the bank will actually help you structure the seller. They'll write the paperwork up for you. They'll partner with you on that. So that last 75 grand, instead of having 10 years to pay it out, you're paying it out in three years. But it means you don't have to bring it to close. So the seller gets his 675 the day you close and his last 75 grand paid out over three years. And you showed up and you did a $750,000 deal without a penny going on the table. If you were to take your buying process, you're buying an agency and you systematize it into a few steps. You get a call from an agent who says, I want to sell. Walk me through the key milestones that you would go through as the buyer to go from first call to closing the book. So first call, general fact finding, building relationship with the seller. We want to be on the same side of the table as a seller. So I'm probably not going to ask a ton about the book. It's going to be more about them. What has them thinking about leaving, getting to know them, understanding that I'm not a threat. I'm going to ask for the reports I mentioned, probably a tax return, statement of operations, the premium, the five reports that we mentioned. Can you use email as over me so I can review? I do not ask what their number is. I do not ask if they have a price. Contrary to both, most negotiations, I like to say the first number. Um, if I say the first number, I can tell you with my experience, I'm going to be in the ballpark. If you say the first number, it might be crazy. And now we have a giant disparity. So kind of what has you leaving? What's going on? Tell me about, tell me your story. Send me these reports. I review the reports. I will usually send over an offer and then call them based on this. And my experience, here's what we see. This is the range, the ballpark. I think this would go for. What are your thoughts? If they like that, then what we do is we go ahead and now we start the process with farmers. This is all assuming I'm an approved buyer. So we start the process with farmers. We start the process with the bank. We're passing the paperwork to the bank for underwriting. We're starting the process for farmers. That takes at least 60 days, uh, minimum 60 days. I think it's maybe 90 at this point with farmers to look for when we can close the deal. So it's conversation and trust. Send me the reports. I want to review and put the first number out there. We're going to negotiate and come to an agreement. We're going to do the process with farmers. We're going to do the underwriting process. Key tidbit for people who are buying. With farmers, you have to be an agent for an entire calendar year before you are eligible for an annual growth bonus. And the reason that matters, if you buy an agency in December, you're not getting the bonus the next March. But that goes immediately the next month into counting your whole year. If you buy an agency in January, you can't get the bonus that year. And you can't get the next year because you only worked 11 months of that first calendar year. So you have to wait two years for a bonus. So I tell people often, if you're going to do a deal, do it in the fall by December because you're shortening your time that you're eligible for an annual growth bonus. If you do it at the start of the year, it ends up being almost two full years before you're eligible for that bonus. I made that mistake. Most lessons are learned through pain. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, of mistakes and reasons why deals fall through, you've helped 30 transactions. You purchased five books yourself. Uh, besides the, the seller financing and that 90% with, with the bank, what are some other things that you see that end up causing deals to fall through? People trying to force through um, buyers who aren't real purchasers. There's a lot of looky-loos in the business. It seems like a good idea. Oh, yeah, I could buy this and 
I pay a hundred grand and I make an extra 7,000 a month. Um, and then you start getting down to the weeds. We're actually going to take over this book of business. You have to integrate or go, you have to go hire two more people and have them ready for this operation. People's ability to execute. So we're looking for a real operator. If it's an existing agent, talk to me about your operation. If you have half a million in premium and you've been here two years and you're trying to buy a $4 million book, it's probably not a great recipe for success. Because if you've done half a million in two years, not a ton of results to speak to the fact that you're going to take over selling four or eight times your size and be able to run it. So we're looking for a real operator. If they're outside the business, same thing. The money is the first checkbox. Can you get the loan? Great. I need to know who you are and are you an operator that you can actually take the steps to integrate. Uh, you mentioned multifamily or like a rental houses. Same thing in that business. So many people say, I'd love to own a couple apartments. I'd like to get a rental home. Very few people actually pull the trigger and go buy five rental properties. They have to talk about it and look at it and go to the class and watch the YouTube videos. So the money is the first checkbox, but who the individuals are, making sure they're not window shoppers, are actually going to execute really matters. Yeah, I was I was surprised when you were going through the through the steps of the initial conversation and then send me the reports. Uh, in the world of buying homes, you you got to have a pre-approval letter or you got to show proof that you have the money. Yep. Uh, do you see that not taking place in no, the world? No, I, I, I don't. Um, now, the, the deals I've done, obviously, where someone has a reputation for being approved, the people that I've advised on, we're bringing in people that are typically approved. Um, if I'm working with someone and they're an $18 million agent, they want to acquire another two, we're not super stressed. But no, not like buying a home. There is no pre-approval process. Um, some agencies will want like an NDA. Um, but then speaking from like my personal experience, we tend to move very, very fast. If I see reports, I can tell within five minutes if it's something I want to buy or something I don't want to buy. And if I want to buy and I'm approved buyer, I'm going to probably send you the offer the same day. Looks well, great. Here's what I think would work. You want to move forward and we're going to, we're going to execute. Um, time kills deals. Time kills deals. Um, people who are like, yeah, I'm going to review it. I'll be out of town for two weeks. I'll take a look. And then I may call the bank at the start of next. No, no, no. <laughs> like this <laughs> time kills deals. People get cold feet and go other directions. Mm -hmm. Do you have all parties sign NDAs? I typically request it. Not everyone does. Um, I've actually never had someone that I've personally purchased ask me to sign an NDA, but in all the deals that I advise on, I require people sign NDAs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's just a it's just a respect factor, and it makes people feel comfortable. Especially some of your older, more tenured agents, they can be a little protective of their information. Um, so it's a respect factor to make sure. But um, I've never had a seller personally ask me to do one. They probably should. We're not out gossiping, but it's a good business practice. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to um, finding opportunities, if you were to say, "I, I want to go buy books of businesses," and um, I'm, I'm pre-approved by the company. I know this bank will approve me. Where do you find deals? Go to the district meetings, go to the conferences. You These things, because there's not, because right now in farmers, you do need to buy in your district. Where you're at matters and who you know matters. Um, if your district sends out any type of production reports or AMR or anything like that, looking at the bottom 20% is probably a good place to start but go to your district meetings. You're going to have to have relationships. You're going to have to get out there and meet people, shake hands and get to know them. Um, and then usually the verbiage I'll use is, Hey, we haven't connected in a little bit curious. I'm going to prove buyer. Do you know of anybody in our district who's looking to sell or retire? And so I'm not asking, do you want to sell me your book of business, but that's a comfortable lead. And we're going to say, no, I haven't heard of anybody or actually I was thinking about it. Um, and so that's usually like the gentle way of doing it, but you've got to get out there and meet people and you've got to have an existing relationship and you do a great job of this. The more of a help you are to the people around you in your district, the more likely you're going to be that person they call when they're having a struggle or they're thinking about leaving and they, they want to have a change more than likely, if you're the one who's coached and helped and provided assistance, they're going to call you and say, Hey, I'm thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And in that meeting, you realize that this person wants to sell, but their book is pretty small. We're talking about maybe 500,000 to a million in premium. So not your ideal market and contract value on something like that. If they're a relatively new first, 
couple of years would be what? It'd be less than 1%, right? Minimal. It'd be minimal. With, with someone like that, do you just take whatever contract value would be, go up maybe a few basis points and buy a small book of business as a, as a deal? Or do you not waste your time? I wouldn't spend the time on it personally. Um, and the reason is we write a fair amount of, of business. Um, and so I've always said, if we write it by the time we close, I'm not going to buy it. So let's take someone who writes 250000 a month. If it's a half a million in premium, it's going to take you 90 days to close. You're going to write five hundred dollars in the next 60. You're going to be that size already. And that's without going through the red tape and the approvals with farmers. And again, farmers allows acquisitions internals. But they do also limit how many you're going to do. They want to see what you do with the opportunity. So do I want to burn the, my uh, opportunity this year on doing a $500,000 acquisition in March? Or do I want to scout for the entire year, find what's really my appetite, what speaks to me, and then close that deal later on? Would it be better to refer out to another agent, maybe a, another agent who's only a million in premium, who this would really be beneficial for them and at a, at a great price? Awesome. Well, this has been very insightful. Thank you. For your time. Thank you for all the wisdom. And there's a lot of really good nuggets here. If agents want to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you if they want you to consult them on the purchase of a book of business? I can, uh, I'll share my information with you if you want to put it out there. And uh, I do some consulting. Um, it's this is a half of a hobby for me. So I don't take on a ton of clients that's more related to size. And um, I, I like a good problem to sink my teeth into, but I'll share that information with you. If you'd like to put it out there. Sounds good. All right. That's it for today. Thank you. Thanks, Vlad.